the right Are there way. a lot of non-board certified plastic surgeons out there? Yes, there are a lot of people who practice plastic surgery who are not even, never went to a plastic surgery residence. No, come on, how, how would that work? Dr. Jonathan Bakhtari. You can see it, I mean, it's crystal clear. I think it's gonna really revolutionize things. Goes, which is a big game changer. Hi, welcome back to another episode of Bakhtari MD. Hi, I'm Dr. Jonathan Bakhtari, and today we're going to be talking about plastic surgery and more specifically breast implants and breast augmentation. I've got a dear friend and colleague here, Dr. Stephen Miller, who's a preeminent plastic surgeon here in Southern Nevada, and I've invited him over as a guest. Uh, we have a lot to go through. I think it's gonna be a lot of great information uh, for anyone who's thinking about having a breast augmentation and the pros and cons and some of the amazing benefits. And so uh, I'm going to start off with Dr. Miller. I'm going to let him introduce himself, give us, tell us a little about his background and, and what his current practice is like. Uh, Dr. Miller, Steve, welcome to the show. Tell us more about you. And I, I know everything, but go ahead and tell our audience. Well, Jonathan, thanks for having sure. me here. I appreciate the chance to get to uh, speak with you and explain to your audience all about plastic surgery I love it. and implants. So I am originally from New York. I went to NYU Medical School. From NYU Medical School, I went out to Dallas, Texas and trained at Baylor in general surgery. I did three years there, and then I went to Kansas City and completed my plastic surgery program. In 2000, I came to Las Vegas. I've been in practice now for 21 years. Wow. And uh, my practice is... Uh, all cosmetic practice, um, and a large portion of my practice is uh, breast implants. Wow, 20, 21 years, 20 so years. you have seen it all. I've seen a lot. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well that's one of the reasons I wanted to have you on, because I think uh, one of the things is that besides just going through the, you know, the pros and cons of the surgery, and also it's just to give the you know satellite perspective of what how things have evolved and where things have gone. Now, I know you do a lot of stuff besides the breast dog, but let's start with there. But, you know, let's start about the, the plastic surgery as a practice. You know, what, what attracted you to plastic surgery uh, when you were just starting out and trying to pick a residency? And Well, my story is kind of unique okay. because I uh, first went into banking, went back and decided to go into medicine. So I went back to college, did my pre-med courses in wow. one year. Uh -huh. uh, a big influencer for me to do that was my cousin who practiced plastic surgery, uh -huh. Dr. Barry Markman. He was a plastic surgeon here in All Vegas. Right. Um, and from the day I started uh, medical school, I knew I wanted to practice plastic surgery wow. and to be in Vegas. Um, those beliefs were confirmed once I started my surgical rotations. I, I loved surgery, and I always had an involvement with plastic surgery because I was often in Vegas at my cousin's practice wow. on vacations. Uh, wow. So I really understood what was involved with plastic surgery, uh -huh. uh, and, and to me it was just intriguing uh, yeah. to be able to make a difference for people on how they feel. Right. So uh, you, you really knew what you were getting yourself into. It wasn't like, oh, I wonder what it's going to be like. You, had, you really had a, more than I think most medical students, your eyes were kind of wide open. Well, oh. So most medical students go into yeah. medical school and they're told to keep an open mind. They go All through right. the rotations. All right. Um, I was told that many times to keep an open mind going through my rotations, but from day one, I knew right. what I was going to do. Right. Was there, uh, and seeing your cousin, was there something that intrigued you more than anything else in terms of the, you know, the, I, I know you get to help a lot of people. What, what, what was the big lure? So, so the first surgery I saw when I came out early and I was um, not even in medical school yet was a young kid having an otoplasty. And uh, he had ears which stuck out tremendously. Mm. I saw him preoperatively. Uh, it, it, it affected him tremendously on how he felt about himself. And then to watch that surgery be done and to see that child afterwards was, was incredible. Oh, and, wow. and I knew for sure this was what I wanted to do. Amazing, amazing. So you're doing the, the love of your life in terms of career, what you really wanted to do, which I think a lot of people... You know, that's what you always say, you know, love what you do. And so you, you've you had that opportunity. I tell my employees that every day. So I love my job. I like going to work each day. I enjoy working with the people I work with, my mm -hmm. employees. And I, and I always say to them, I 
you should enjoy coming to work each day. And right. we all do in my office. Right. I'm sure I just, you know, for, for to support that, that's, you know, er, almost every patient I've referred to you and, uh, uh, you know, they all come back with the same thing. You know, they, you can tell some of that love, you know, permeates the whole place and that caring <coughs> and that extra t- touch uh, of genuinely, you know, finding out why someone wants something and, and everything behind it. Thank you. Well, plastic surgery, just the concept of plastic surgery, when you begin to think about it, is a very intimidating environment. So when you walk into an office, it's naturally a little intimidating. So so it's always an effort of myself and my employees to, to make people feel very comfortable yeah. and to kind of demystify it and to yeah. make it yeah, very But why easy. do you think it's more intimidating than walking into your primary care office or your, uh, you know, just like a general surgeon's office? Well, Certainly over the last years, uh, from when I started 21 years ago to now, plastic surgery is much more mainstream, much more accepted. I mean, 30, 40 years ago, only the, the movie stars did plastic surgery, and now everyone does plastic surgery, right? It's very, very common. But the idea when, when you're going into a plastic surgeon's office and you need to talk about your breasts, uh, how you feel about something, or how you want to change something. Yeah, it it, it is a naturally intimidating discussion. Right, um, and 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 for some people, not for yeah. everyone. So I think as a surgeon and mm-hmm. and as a group, as an office, you really want to try to make that process as easy as possible. Well, let's jump right into um, you know breast augmentation, and uh, and the place I really want to start with is. When somebody comes to see you, obviously, you know, there's reasons to be looking at breast augmentation. Obviously, you know, uh, if someone's had cancer and they're having reconstruction, uh, you know, that's sort of one thing. But let's start off with people who want to have it done for cosmetic reasons. So, and I know you see the whole gamut in your 20 years of younger, middle-aged, older women, but can you kind of lump, you know, the, the big group, age group, not even age groups, the big categories of either people or reasons why people come to see you. Uh, can Are there several big groups? So when you talk about age groups, you said it right, right from the beginning. It is all age groups. Um, I, I've done a breast dog on someone as old as in their late 60s or early 70s. Wow. And I've done them on as young as 18 years old. So it, it, it really encompasses all age groups. Um, when you ask me which is the more common age group, I think most people would assume it's, it's the 18 to 30-year-olds. I think in my practice, I have more of the 25 to 35-year-olds, mm-hmm. um, someone who's had two children, they're done having children, they're not happy with how their breasts look post-pregnancy, really? and they want to improve them. Now, I also have... The younger patient, which I think you would have expected. Right, I would have expected, you know, somebody who's younger and maybe still single, and but you're saying you're actually seeing more. So as my practice has evolved, um, mm-hmm. I, I think early on I had more of that, um, I, but but I have both to be honest with you, mm-hmm. and maybe it's close to equal. I, I have the ones who've had children, their bodies right. have changed, and they want to improve <clears> it. <throat> And I have the young women who right. are who are who who may or may not be single who right. want to increase their breast size. So let me ask you a question: When a, <clears throat> when a patient comes to see you, just because you know they're they're potentially having surgery, do you feel a need f- to fully understand their motives clearly? And you, in other words, you know, if 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 um, if somebody wants to buy a new car, they, they, they don't have to explain to the, to the dealership why they need this car. They're just like, I want that car. But when they come to you and say, hey, I want to have, you know, actually any plastic surgery, do you feel a, a, your, it's your duty to make sure they're having it for the, you know, potentially not for the wrong reasons, which we can, you know, speculate well, about, or the right reasons? Do you go, how deep do you go into that motive? You try to listen to people and you try to understand why they may be thinking it. I think you cannot really give every person the first degree on why they're doing this right. and, and to push them very hard, I think you would have no patience. So right. I think you have to listen. A, a lot of what right. I do is listen to try to understand and, and to try okay. to give fair, honest advice on on whether or not this surgery is right for them. Right. Um, there are certain red flags. If you have a patient who's 42 years old and this is a 20th cosmetic procedure and 
and you know, if every six months or a year, this person may have body dysmorphic syndrome and this may not be a good candidate for surgery. So, so certainly you try to understand the motives, but I don't know with anything yeah. you could ever completely, completely. understand someone's but motives. But you make an attempt. Uh, and so let, let's talk about some of the common reasons, like you mentioned somebody who's had two kids, so that's one. What are some of the more common reasons people come to you? Obviously it's cosmetic, but what 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 are can you put them in different categories of well of i think the first category is what you just mentioned right and and i think that's extremely common um uh, the other category is someone who just wants their breast to be larger and and mm-hmm. that could be for all different reasons they 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 feel better about having a larger breast they want their clothes to fit differently mm-hmm. um and you would think as you said it was only the younger women but but mm-hmm. i had a 70 year old woman probably 12 14 years ago Mm -hmm. who was very embarrassed when a silicone fake implant fell out when she was at a dance and decided she wanted her breast to be larger because she Mm -hmm. wants her clothes to fit the way they want to fit Mm -hmm. and that was a difficult decision i made that patient get medical clearance i actually had that patient spend the night overnight at a recovery center um but she was 70 going on 50 Mm -hmm. and you can't always judge someone by their age by their chronological age Okay, so let's just say someone comes to your office and they don't know anything about breast implants. They just know that they're looking into it. Uh, they want to understand what their options are and they want to understand what the pros and cons, the risks, and, and the, you know, of course, the benefits of how they might look. So do you have a sort of like a standard, I mean, you, have, you obviously listen to people, but walk me through that initial visit. Hi, this is Dr. Bakhtari. Sorry to interrupt, but I just want to let you know the reason we created this channel was to bring you really one-of-a-kind inside information on healthcare works, information you're not going to find anywhere else. And we want to continue to bring you this kind of content. So please help us grow. It really helps if you would subscribe, like, and add comments. Add comments about what you're viewing, add comments about what you would like to see in the future, and we'll try to bring that information to you. Again, we really want to be the source where you get information you cannot find anywhere else. Information that you're watching currently on this video, you know, is really rare, and we want to continue to promote and grow grow it. So we really need your help. Please like, subscribe, and comment. Thank you so much. Be well. 20 years ago, the internet wasn't as popular. People weren't on okay. constantly searching. But now people come in with a lot of preconceived thought processes, right? Because yeah. they've done research. Got it. So, so it's very common to see research about breast implants. People come in with things already on their mind. As well as it's not unusual that a patient has seen multiple consults. So you may not be their first consult. You may be their second or third consult. Um, but with the assumption that patients, I always make the assumption when a patient comes in, that they know nothing about implants. Okay. So that I'm not missing something. So mm-hmm. a patient comes into my office, mm-hmm. comes in the room, my employee, uh, my medical assistant or nurse, or myself will do a medical history. We want to make sure that it's medically safe to have a surgical procedure. Okay, got that. Once okay. we've done the medical history, we're going to sit down and we're going to say to the patient that we're going to have two parts to this console. One part is to explain the surgical decisions that you and I will make together. The next part is for me to get a better understanding on what you want to achieve and for me to be fair with you based on what your breasts look like now, Right. what I can achieve. And Got we're it. going to accomplish this in two ways. Okay. One way is after I examine you, we are going to try implants on. And we're going to put them in a sports bra and have you put a t-shirt on tight t-shirt and let you understand how that size increase will look on your body wow i don't think most people know that that you they go through like and how how accurate is that if once they get i mean how close do you get with that strategy it's relatively close so if you think about putting an implant over breast tissue depending upon how much breast tissue someone has it may the overall volume will be the same but the projection may be slightly different because it's sitting on top of something but we have actual real sizers would actually cup the breast to okay. give even a better understanding. Okay, so, so they so try it on. Be pretty good. Okay, so they try it on. What else? So, so the most difficult decision they're always trying is what size to go. So that helps okay. a lot, right? The next thing is trying to show through a picture album breasts that look similar to theirs, 
with a similar size implant that you're right. trying to put in right. so they can have a realistic expectation of what to expect. Right. Um, so you have to spend a lot of time explaining to a patient and trying to understand what they want to achieve and being fair with them on what you can achieve. Do you, do you, will you actually ever say, you know, I understand you want your this size, but it just doesn't fit your body, and I, and I would argue against it? Or do you, in other so words... I try not to judge people based on what they're... So everyone's eye for what's beauty is different, right? Right. So if someone wants to put a, a larger size implant, I'm not going to say, well, I think a smaller breast is prettier. I'm, that's not my right. role to do. I see. But my role to do is can I do that surgery successfully and will that fit in the breast tissue and look cosmetically I see. nice? But, but, but let's, I mean, again, you know, you do this every day. So, but I mean, could you make the argument someone's so petite that, you know... The, I can't the, put a big implant no, in that patient. That's what I'm saying. Where you so, just simply, so I say I can't do it. So their, their body... You're saying physically. You're physically, really, right. So, right. So I try to make... I say, let's say, I think an implant from from 400 to 500 cc's, I can fit in that breast. And, so and, we'll try, and then we'll try... So they get implant. a limit of what they can given their body habit is. So the, the first thing I'll explain to a patient is that every 150 to 200 cc's of a breast implant yeah. equals around one cup size. Okay. So they have to have a definition. They have to understand how I many see. cc's will equal a cup size so they understand what increase they're gonna have. Right. Now, what's interesting is there's no standard breast size, right? So if you go to Victoria's Secrets, they may measure you as right. a D, and if you go to <laughs> Macy's or Dillard's, you may be a B, right? right? So I wanna know what they see their breasts as when I they see. look in a mirror, okay. and what they're ultimately trying to be, and that will always be my first question. So you were gonna ask me a question, is there ever a time I say I can't do it? So, right. so it happens sometimes that a woman comes in and they say, my, I want my breast to be almost the same size. I've had two children, but I want a little more fullness on top. But I don't want my breast to be lifted. I don't right. want those scars. Well, that's very hard to accomplish, right? Because you're going to have to typically, depending upon the width of the breast, increase the breast size by at least a cup and a half. Right. So there's always things that you have to explain to patients. Within surgical limits. Within surgical right, limits. Right, but... But so it never happens where you say, honestly, that, that's probably going to give you a lot of back pain because given given your size. And but how would I know that? So, I so mean, do, can you know? I guess I'm saying, can, can you predict and say, uh, you can't? You know, well, so, but given a person's weight, I mean, can't you extrapolate and say, or, and again, you do this, I'm not arguing, but I'm just saying, can you just say, no, well, you're, you're asking the, very, the higher the weight, the more likelihood. You're, you're asking very fair questions. So, so when we explain, to people about putting an implant in, right? So if a person comes in has had two herniated discs, has chronic back pain, and they're gonna add 500 cc's on each side of their breast, they're gonna mm -hmm. add about a pound to each side, so two right. pounds total. They've gotta understand that right. this may increase their back discomfort. So you just explain the level of risk, right. but you don't say yes or right. no. But, but, if, but you could have someone who has no implants in, mm -hmm. they're thin, they're yeah, in they're good thin. shape, and they have horrific back, back pain. pain. No, I so it's them. very hard for us to tell patients that we're going to put this size in. Now, we have women who come in with too large breasts and they're complaining of back and neck pain, and we have women who so small breasts that want to be larger. So it's all right. women trying to decide what's right for them. Got it. So maybe you were going to get to it, but so at which point do you talk about, like, for example, the most obvious one for me at least is silicone versus saline. Is that is that the next conversation? So, or once you figure out the you know how, what size is good for them that they're happy with so if you if you go back to what i originally had mentioned the consoles divided into two parts right? right the surgical portion and then trying to figure out what's right for the patient the first thing i talk about which is probably a little more boring for the patient is the surgical decisions and they are divided into three parts yes part one is where we're going to cut right and we have to make a decision where that incision will be part two is where that implant will be placed will the pocket be created above the muscle or below the muscle. Mm. The third decision is the implant. So when I'm in the operating room, I've made my incision, I've opened the pocket, I now have to ask the nurse to open an implant. Is that implant gonna be silicone? Is it gonna be saline? Is it gonna be a high profile or a moderate profile? Well, explain it, that, a high profile, low profile. So, so implants, although they're round, they come in different projections. So an implant could be very flat and wide, or can be very narrow with a lot of projection. Mm -hmm. a, 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 a narrow and a high projecting implant would be a, called a high profile implant. 
a flatter and wider implant would be a, a moderate or a low profile. Okay. And that's much easier to demonstrate when you're in my office and I'm showing you five implants that right. are all the same size but look slightly different. Got it. So it's a profile. So, so, so we decide saline versus silicone. We decide profile. And we decide approximately, without trying them on yet, what their goal is for size increases. So uh, if a woman is five foot tall and narrow, maybe 150 cc's will increase one cup size. If someone's five six or five seven, maybe, and, and they're a little wider in build, maybe it's more 180 or 200 cc's a cup size. So if that person's goal is to increase by approximately two cups, I say, well, maybe we need around 400 cc's. And then we can also look at the profile because we know we need to fit the chest wall Okay. So part of that decision would come that okay. way. Okay, so, so I've got a bunch of things. I've got, is the implant going to be above, below, silicone or saline, low profile, high profile, and how much volume? Which one is, does it matter which one you decide in which order in terms of I'm, if you're walking me through well, I always walk someone through the surger, surgery itself. So the first thing I do in surgery is cut. So okay. the first thing I want to know is where they want that incision well, to be. Okay, the right, okay. Right. So, so that's let, the let's first st surgical decision. So let's stop so right there. Just... So let's stop there. Okay. Okay. Walk me through that. In other words, so if we're going to do where where the surgery is going to be, or uh, you know, walk me through with the pros and so, cons. So you're going to tell me, okay, these are the three options of where it's going to be. These are the pros and cons. Right. So so there are four incisions that exist. Not that I do all four, but there's the infra areola incision. There's a fold incision, which is just under the areola of the breast, right below the nipple. Okay, yeah. okay. Where there's a color junction, change, right, right, right. <clears throat> there's the fold incision. There's an ax axillary incision, armpit incision, mm -hmm. and a belly button incision. Okay, let's talk about the common ones that you mainly. What what are like ninety percent of the ones you do? So I tend to do the infra areola incision probably eighty to ninety percent of the time, and the other ten percent of the time is the fold incision. Okay, so walk me through the pros and cons of those so two. I think the biggest issue for people when they get an implant in mm -hmm. is the appearance of the scar. So when your 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 goal often as a plastic surgeon knowing when you cut there'll always be some scar right is to hide that scar so when you can put a scar in a color junction change mm -hmm. if the scar gets slightly dark it will match the okay. darker areola if it gets slightly light light tends to match the skin so in six <laughs> or eight point. weeks i tend not to see that scar. okay and i gotta say in in the last 20 21 years it's rare that i got a complaint about the scar i got to revise a scar well there must be some downside to that because right. otherwise so you everyone go, just through right that. so you you go through the nipple incision one is it's a smaller incision right yeah so it's technically takes a little extra time some more yeah sometimes you have to fit that implant through a small incision right. so if it's a larger silicone implant you may have to use a special funnel device to put it through the through the through wow. the incision okay um, you also are going through more ducts. So there's, if you have a young woman who's asking you about breastfeeding, this incision would lower the ability slightly more than another, a different incision what goes through less ducts because all the ducts converge on the nipple. But in my experience, a lot of women, if, if they were able to breastfeed prior, often they're able to breastfeed after. But certainly if they were just on the edge, we may tip them over where they can no longer Well, But how about if they're single and they haven't breastfed yet? Do you, well, how do you walk them through that decision? Well, Jonathan, so even if they're single and they haven't breastfed yet, you know as a physician there's a percentage of them who will never be able to breastfeed, right? right? So we don't know that. So, so when we discuss it, we go through that and how important that is um, for right. the woman, right? So if, if, if they say that so of course it's a lot of listening, right? So if, if, if I have a patient right. and they say they absolutely want to minimize the risk of, 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 of affecting the ducts and being able to breastfeed, maybe a fold incision yeah. would be better. Or maybe even going to another plastic surgeon and having it through the belly button or the armpit where they may go through no ducts. And okay, the, so I get that. So then if, I, if someone said that, you would, you would still have one more option for them to do the fold, right? When everything converges on the areola, that incision is going to go through more ducts. Right. But if so you, when you do the fold, explain to people what what does that involve? So that where's that incision going to? So be? it's it's a small incision, maybe five centimeters in the fold of the breast, meaning the hope, literally underneath yeah. the breast. And the hope is that that hides <coughs> well, 
But that's going to for sure be much more visible. Well, it depends, right? So if 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 the patient's 22 years old and a super perky breast, and there's no drop of the breast over the crease, there's yeah. no ptosis of the breast, droop of the right. breast, right? Then yes, it's going to show. And to me, that's not a very pretty scar right. because it may get darker light. Now, hopefully over time, it will fade. But if a, if a person has a breast, and, 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 and I use the word ptosis, it's a droop to their breast, yeah. uh, that scar may hide very well. So, of course, it's a decision-making process. Okay. So, by the way, why don't you do the other two, which is, you said, uh, go from the belly and from the arm? So, it, it's always been my belief that, you know, when you put an implant in, you want to develop that pocket so that it sits right. When you're that far away okay. from the cleavage and from from the surgical area that you're operating on, I think it's a greater risk of poor placement of the implant. So a lot of your experience though, I'm sure plastic surgeons have data and studies. So do we have, do we have st studies, you know, uh, evidence-based studies, for example, some of the things you talked about that it impacts, you know, lactation, for example, if you go through the areola, or do we have studies that say, you know, I, if you go through the abdomen, you know, the, the taking a thousand people, yeah, so, it's not going to sit as well. Or yeah, so I can't tell you each study, but yes, in our in broad in strokes, our, in, our, in broad strokes, in our meetings, you you, you discuss things like that. Um, the the belly button incision would mainly, obviously, be for a saline implant because you couldn't push a silicone implant all okay. the way up through there. Um, it it certainly would involve a lot of trauma going through the through the soft tissue to get to the right. breast. And I think it would be common sense that in order to create a pocket which is round in the cleavage <laughs> right. that when the breast gets pushed right. in or you wear a nice right. outfit, if you're not right there, it's right. gonna be a it's gonna be a little more difficult. Now there are surgeons who maybe do hundreds of them a year who have gotten to the point that they are that good at it. Wow. That they feel comfortable so, that they could get good places. So are there surgeons that like you're suggesting like almost exclusively or they're known for that or does so in this town i don't know anyone who's doing um belly button incisions right, right? um i think there's a couple guys who do armpit right. incisions but they're less common i think okay. most of us accept okay. the fact that so, we're going to get a better result so, going through the two so, more but, common so in incisions. the united states you think majority number one if you took all plastic surgeons would be so, the fold incision and then the areola okay incision. and between those two which one do you think is the most common? fold incision Really? But I would think in Vegas, it may be the areola incision. So I, 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 you know, I think I get the the surgical incision. So what is the next? Is a saline silicone? Is that the so next? So the next step is deciding whether to go over the muscle or under the okay. muscle. Okay. So, okay. Now so let's so, talk about the pros and cons. So, of that. so when you go under the muscle, uh, the breast will sit a little higher. By the way, just so we know, under the muscle, you mean under the under pec the muscle. pectoralis muscle? Okay, yeah, got I'm it. Sorry. Uh, so we put an implant under the pec muscle. So that implant would sit high because the pec muscle sits higher. Okay. So as long as a breast is perky, you can put a breast implant under the muscle. Now, if you have a droopy breast, let's say you've had three children, your breast has dropped significantly, if you put that implant under the muscle, you will have an implant up high and a breast down low and a very elongated, almost like two breasts on each side. So that's not going to work. So what do you do if a patient comes in and says, I only want to be under the muscle? Well, then you have to... Why would they say that? I don't want to interrupt you, but well, why would they... Why? You said they have preconceived notions. So the person that comes in and says, I want it under the muscle, where what's so, driving that? So the advantage of being under the muscle is, one, the implant will tend to stay higher, so less droop. Remember, I said implant, not the breast, right? right? So the implant will tend to stay higher, plus there'll be more coverage over the implant to prevent rippling and make the implant less palpable. And there is some belief that the risk of capsular contracture may be slightly lower under the muscle versus over well, the Well, even muscle. if it con contracts, you wouldn't maybe see it as so, readily. So actually, you're right. So that's always the debate the other way, is that they may have a slight capsular contracture, <coughs> but you may not feel it because there's more coverage. Right. But if you put it underneath the muscle, right, you're, you're assuming that over the years... They will, like they may not have droop when you put it under the muscle, but later on they may. And have I droop. often see that, right? So that's so so. There's good and bad to each thing, and you have to understand those options. So if you have a woman who has a C or D breast, it's up and perky, yeah. and you put that implant under the muscle, 
then maybe eight, nine years later when they've had children, the implant's still sitting under the muscle and yeah. the breast has dropped off. What you hope <coughs> is that you release the muscle in a way that the implant drops a little bit with the breast to maintain. Let me ask you a question. When a patient comes into your office and they've had an implant before and they're coming for a redo or this and that, can you, because you, you know, obviously you do this for it, can you do a physical exam without touching the patient and tell if it's below the muscle or above? Can, can you, in your years of, is this so obvious to the trained eye? No. So if I look at them without them doing anything, I would not know. But if I ask them to flex their muscle, see the muscle's still functional. So right. if I ask them to flex their muscle and their implant squeezes down and up, then I know there's a good chance they are under the muscle. Okay, so would that show up in a dress? In other words, is there a way, I guess what I'm trying to understand is the pros and cons. Is there a way that, you know, someone says, I want it to be really natural, so if I accidentally lift up my arms and flex my chest, and I'm wearing if a- someone, Who would be the one, which group of women would be bothered a lot by them flexing their muscle and having an implant underneath. Those would be professional weightlifters, right? Okay. So a professional weightlifter who performs <clears throat> doesn't have a lot of breast tissue because they're very muscular right, and right, thinned down. Right. Yet if you put their implant under their muscle, they're very pec strong. Right. You may weaken their muscle by right. the release. And when they're on stage and they flex, their breast is going to look a little strange. Right. Okay. They often choose to go above the muscle. Got it. But your average in shape, your average 30, in shape 30 person, year old. unless they're flexing the muscle, or they get a flexion deformity. So right. sometimes okay. when the muscle's released in a way right. and they flex, it causes okay. an extra crease on the breast. Got so, it. Okay, so, but I would imagine under the muscle, under the pec muscle, you don't have to worry about the lactation issues. I'm trying to figure out the pros of it. Well, let's, the, let's talk about the pros. So, okay. so I said there'll be more tissue coverage. I said it will hold the implant better, right? So right. if you put a breast implant above the muscle, the chance of it drooping quicker would be Okay. Because of the weight within the breast tissue. Right. You'll get better mammograms because you have a separation between the muscle right. and the implant right. and the actual breast tissue. Okay. So when the person goes for a mammogram, that interface, right, where the breast tissue meets the muscle will be clearer because it's okay. under the muscle. No, I get it. So under the muscle, better mammogram, better breastfeeding? Low, well, I, I didn't say breastfeeding. You said okay. breastfeeding. No. I, don't well, think, I don't think it will change breastfeeding. But you're not But you're not going through all that duct tissue. Well, that's, the, uh, if, yeah. if, if you make the incision of the fold or you make the incision of the nipple, you're going to go through uh, the areola incision. You're going to go through the exact same I amount see. of breast tissue I to see. reach the muscle. I see. You still got to get to the muscle. To put well, the implant so on how it. are you going to get under the pec muscle? And I don't want to get too involved surgically. How do you get, even if you're going through the areola, we, we, how do you get it under the pec muscle? We either go underneath the pec muscle where it attaches to the chest wall, or mm -hmm. we go through the pec muscle and make an incision. And you actually up. make an incision in the pec? Wow. Yeah. And is that is that more often the case where you make an incision in the pec muscle? Uh, there's different techniques. So each plastic surgeons can do it all different ways. Got it. What's the most common? I think the most common still would be to go down to the um, inferior border and release the muscle and, and, and then place the implant underneath. But I think it depends. So if you're going from the fold, that would certainly be the way you do it. If you're going from the, the nipple, you may go directly through the back muscle and then open it up. Maybe because I'm a physician, I'm asking all these sort of granular. Do patients ask this level of granular? Not to this deep. That, no, I don't mean like. But, so, so, but, they, so they, they don't ask you they, how are you going to get underneath that muscle? No, so, so, which by the know, way is good because now they're hearing it, right? But, okay. but it's very hard. You know, you got to remember, we train for a lot of years, right, and, right? And it's very hard to explain every surgery to the detail of what stitch we put in and how we move things, right? So, so when we do a breast reduction versus a breast lift, there's very different surgeries, but the scars are exactly the same. Right. So when patients start asking me what's the difference between right. the two. <clears throat> that gets very complex right, to explain. Right, right, right. Okay, I get it. So, okay, so I think we we got uh, that. We got the, they have to figure out if it's going to be above or or, or or below the 
pec muscle. What is the next thing? So the next thing is I would show them a silicone implant and a saline implant. Oh, perfect. You know, I've been waiting to get this because I think everyone wants to. This is if, usually where we spend the most amount of time. Really? Right? That's so interesting. All right, so walk me through it. I'm, so, I'm a new patient. Uh, you so know, now they've my wife, made, their, they've made their decision for incisions. They've made their decisions above or below the muscle. Mm -hmm. The next decision, what are we going to use? And we're going to decide between a silicone and a saline. I'm going to let them feel it. So I have them on my counter. Right. They, they put the silicone implant <laughs> okay. in their hand. They put the saline implant. And they okay. feel them both. Okay. If they're with a partner or a significant other, right. I have them feel them. By the way, how often, just as long as you sidetrack, how often does that happen someone comes alone or with their significant other? Taking all comers. So the last 100 people you saw. 70% of the time, someone's at least bringing someone with them. Really? Whether it's their family member, their sister, right. their friend, or their husband. A support system. A support system. And how often is that support system a significant other? I would say more times than not. It's a significant other. Otherwise, it could be a relative, family, yeah. a friend who's had yes. had the surgery. Okay, so go ahead. So you they, you get them to feel both, and then what, they, what happens? They, they feel both implants, and, and usually they'll say the silicone implant feels better. Right? <laughs> Most people, okay. it's a thicker, more viscous, feels more like right. real breast tissue. Okay. All right. Then we then I'll usually hold the implants up and let it kind of dangle, and I'll show them that the silicone implants tend to ripple a little less than the saline implant. So it is at times when breast tissue is thinner, you can sometimes see imperfections of implants. So sometimes a woman may have an implant and they have a slight ripple, upper pole or in the cleavage area. Um, so one of the reasons sometimes may, patient may also choose silicone, not just for feel, is because it may ripple a little less. So we have two advantages, okay. there, right? They also come in more profile, so they're able to have a little more choice on size. Remember when we discussed the silicone, earlier, silicone. Exactly. And they have more profiles because it forms, you can form, because they, saline is more, uh, I less think, viscous. I think over the last 10 or 15 years, companies have significantly invested more money into designing silicone implants. So saline implants have changed very little in the last 15 years. So saline implants I'm using today is no different for the most part than the ones I was using in 2001, 2002, 2003. The silicone implants have gotten much more cohesive, really? so much more gummy bear-like, mm -hmm. the terminology that people use, and they have come much more fill volume, so they ripple less, as well as more... Profiles. Yeah. What are they doing? I mean, just I don't want to get too chemical on you. But what what are they doing to the silicone? Are they adding stuff to it? Are they when it, they? It's put, how many what, bonds? What? The cohesiveness of the silicone implant. with oxygen or whatever it's uh, the bonds of silicone. Yeah, yeah. So so early implants when I when I, a patient had a ruptured implant, right. the silicone was very liquidy. I have an implant sitting in a Tupperware container on my counter when I do a consult that I cut in half five years ago. Right. And that implant looks like a gummy bear candy cut in half. There's wow. no leakage. There's no dripping. That's silicone. so interesting. We're going to talk about leakage later right. on. But uh, when did that change occur? So if someone's sitting out there saying, I had a silicone implant 10 years ago, 15 years ago, five years ago, when did you see the big change in the quality of the so, silicone? So there's been two major changes. <clears throat> um, well, there's been many major changes. But in around 1989, 1990, the way the outer shell was made changed significantly. So when I came in practice in 2000, if I Googled and looked at the FDA website, they said any pr implant pre-1988 or 89 or 90 had almost a 90% chance of rupture. Wow. Due to the way they were, the outer shell. By 10 years. Well, no. So I was in, well, so I guess 11, 12 <coughs> years in because I started practicing in yeah. 2000, right? So, so there was a pretty high rupture rate at that point for those implants, 1988, 80, 89. Um, due to the manu the way the shells were manufactured. Now, the shells are manufactured differently, so the rupture rates right. are lower. The other major change is the cohesiveness of silicone. So when I go and I take out a very old implant on someone and it's broken, it is like liquid silicone. Wow. It's very messy. I changed my gloves multiple wow. times. It's, it's sticky. It's well, messy. Well, the newer implants are much more... Cohesive. When you say newer, though, I was trying to get to, like, when do you think, so if I came to you and said, well, this person had an implant 
the, when do you start thinking I'm going to be dealing with the old implants? What year? Well, Im implant. So you got to remember, silicone implants were taken off the market in 1992, reintroduced right. in 2006. Right. The reintrodu but but the implant companies were gearing up for that reintroduction. So in 2006, they started doing a lot of studies with these more cohesive implants. Initially, more on the shaped implants, the gummy bears. So implants. since they've come back. In 2006, not, you think they're not more? exactly, not exactly. So, okay. so, so probably now in the last seven or eight years, seven eight years, it's been more these more gummy bear like implants. But you still could have someone who were in certain studies early on in 2006, right? 2007. But the bulk of them were in the last seven eight years. You think, right? So my in? so yes, and, and you got to also remember different implant companies came out earlier with got the, the more cohesive implant. Okay, so so getting back to the choice then. So we're so we talked about some of the pros. It looks more natural, the silicone, uh, and uh, if it ruptures, you know, it's it, not as bad as before. So still explain to me, so w when would someone choose saline and, you know, despite all that? So that? the first thing to say is, in the, <coughs> in the opinion of, 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 of the Plastic Surgery Society and most plastic surgeons, both implants are safe, saline or silicone. Right. The question becomes, what do you prioritize? So a person knows the advantage of silicone that we discussed versus the, the understanding that no implants are lifetime devices. They will all eventually break. As they get older, the chance of them breaking goes up. With a saline implant, when they break, you know it. <laughs> With a silicone implant, when they break, you don't know right. it. It's considered a silent right. rupture. So it's how important, it, how uncomfortable a patient is with that concept of not knowing mm -hmm. when an implant may break. Now, the FDA gives recommendations. They recommend with a silicone M implant, an MRI after three years and every other year, right. and that you prophylactically change them out at some point. Now, if you're 23, 24 years old and, and you're getting a silicone implant, you may have multiple surgeries in a lifetime for changing them out. With a saline implant, when they break, you know it, and there's no reason to change it unless you have a problem. Okay. But we know eventually they will all break. So, like out of the last hundred breast implants you've done, what percent, roughly, was silicone and what percent do you think was saline? So, I think <clears throat> more and more people are trending towards silicone. So, mm -hmm. I think in the U.S. it's probably 70, 80 percent silicone. In Europe, it's maybe 90, 95 percent silicone. Uh, in my practice, when I go through that full explanation, trying to be unbiased in their decision-making process. Mm -hmm. I'm probably 60, 65% silicone at this point and 35, 40% saline. The people that opt for saline, is it 100% from the rupture? Because I also hear you have to, potentially, if you're gonna follow the rules, <clears throat> <clears throat> potentially if you're gonna follow the rules, uh, get an MRI every two to three years, for sure have it removed after 10 years. How much is the decision when people pick saline from the, you know, the rupture aspect of it, they'll be easier to detect versus also the headache of having MRIs and, uh, you know, for sure having it replaced roughly around 10 years. What pushes people towards saline? Is it a combination of all that, or is is the breaking the main issue that that? I gets think it's you? a combination. So you know, if you think about the saline implant, if it breaks, so we didn't get completely into it. If it breaks, right? It's a drink of water. It's mm -hmm. a salt water solution. Mm -hmm. It's saline. It's what's in your body. So mm -hmm. there's no potential consequences to it breaking, mm -hmm. and you know that it is oh, broken. Oh, so it's the healthiness, okay? Right? right. But if a silicone implant breaks, we hope the breakage. We now know it's more gummy. It's less liquidy. We you, your body forms a wall around the implant, so there's a secondary wall. But if that silicone was to get into the breast tissue, we don't think it necessarily causes cancer or autoimmune disease, but it can cause lumps and bumps and require future biopsies. Um, so all those potential issues weigh. So the patient has to make an informed decision. So <clears throat> when you explain everything, mm -hmm. they decide, well, you know, I want a more natural feeling breast, but looks more real, the implant's considered safe, the risks are relatively low, I'll go with silicone. Or I want to feel <clears throat> very comfortable, very safe, know there's very little potential issues and go with saving. Do you find that younger patients tend more for one and like some of their 20s, you think they'll go more for silicone 
at, as a percentage versus some in their 40s or 50s, or is it like... So I'm going to tell you an interesting thing, Sure. which I didn't mention. So believe it or not, the FDA has different age categories for these implants. So to have a saline implant, you can be 18. To have a silicone implant, you have to be 22. Why is that? It makes no sense to me. But, but what was their thing? Per the FDA, they yeah. feel. Uh, you may I know. Be. I know so the FDA. I have, to, I have to assume that the decision-making process says there's a little more thinking that goes with silicone. So they want a little more maturity of the patient to make an informed decision. That would be my guess. Sort of like some states changing that uh, drinking limit to 21 or something just right so this is the fda has made this decision so you Um, can't you could not give a 19 year old unless they had a breast deformity for cosmetic reasons i would imagine second reason why some of the younger people may do Mm safe they're cheaper they're not as expensive so the person's financial means may play a role in the decision making process how much i mean as a percentage like it's like half 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 off no it's not half off but it's it's around eleven hundred dollars cheaper to use a saline implant versus silicone do you have a (laughs) do you have a bunch of people who are like waiting till they're 22 like literally like i'll come back and see you like as soon as they turn 22, they're in your office the yeah, following I've week? I've done them on their birthdays. On their birthdays. Yeah, so so I, I, I follow the FDA guidelines very strictly. Of so course. if they're not 22, they're not getting right. that. If I come a, somebody comes in a week before, they're not getting, that they're not getting it. No. No. So, and you, do you check ID like a bartender? You, I'm just so, joking. But, every, <laughs> but, but so, yes, we do, because every medical process practice has an obligation no, that's to great. take an ID. So we do take an ID. No, um, I'm joking. Uh, but, I mean, sure. it's, it's, really, it's really that strict where you say so like when you turn I don't 20. think it makes sense I'm not a big believer yeah. that they need to be 22 to get silicone yeah. implants but if the FDA tells me this is what they could deem as appropriate then yes I do follow got it okay so uh, <clears throat> I think we've gone over the pros and cons of silicone and say anything I I left out between those two that you kind of really stress no no I think I think you got I think so after that is asked to the patient yeah. the patient will tell me I want saline, I want silicone. So now we come to the next question, is how big are you trying to be? So that involves two things. How big do you consider your breast now? Mm-hmm. And what cup would you like to be? Right. Okay. It's not how big your bra is, it's what do you see in the mirror, right? So if someone tells me they're a B breast and they'd like to be a D, mm-hmm. I know they wanna go up two cups. So I'll explain to a patient, as we mentioned earlier in this mm-hmm. discussion, that every 150 to 200 cc's equals a cup. So right. So. After all is that th- that's done, is it then just scheduling the surgery, no, or is no. there anything else involved? So in then, that? then is I think the most that part takes ten minutes. Now the more interesting part of the consult is trying to understand what the patient wants to achieve and right. being fair with the patient what I can achieve. So the f- next process would be having the patient change. I step out of the room. I come back in the room. I'll look at the differences in their right. breast. It's one fold lower than the other. One nipple lower than right. the other. I may take some measurements one breast larger right. and then we'll try implants on and after we try implants on they'll look at before and after right. pictures what are hopefully similar to what their breasts look like now and what size they're liking to go at that point i'll answer whatever questions or concerns they have um, my someone from my office will go through what the process is if they want to schedule surgery um, and they'll make that decision at that point. okay so um I think I got it. So when all is said and done, I know we talked off air, like, you know, the good news is the vast majority, 90%, you know, are, or 95% are amazingly happy with their decision 10 years you know, later, whatever. But having said that, do you, I mean, when to someone just kind of contemplating this, you know, when you sit down with them and say, listen, you know, if you're 22, more than likely you're looking, no matter how well things go, you're looking at five to eight surgeries potentially in, in your life if you're replacing them every year. You know, if it's silicone. Well, hopefully not every year. I mean, sorry, <laughs> let's think about it. If you're, if you're, repla- you're looking at five to 10 surgeries if you're replacing them every 10 years. If you're, uh, you know, if you're having MRIs, if you do follow the protocol and have MRIs, especially, you know, with silicone every two to three years, Go ahead. Potentially at your own cost, because not every insurance will cover your MRI. Right. So, it, well, so that may be real expensive. Wow. Right. And then, you know, if your breasts, if your natural breasts change or, or whatever, and uh, you know, just your own body habit has changed and, and you know, 
later on it's too big, too small, whatever. When you factor all that in, do they really clearly see that in front of them and say, you know, despite all that, you know, I think, or do they kind of talk themselves out of that? Because I know you tried to explain it to them. How do they process all of that and then still say, yeah, let's do it? I know you've been at that crossroads. So what does that, what so does that talk look like? I think for me, I have to <clears throat> be honest with the patient, go through the good and the bad of the surgery, explain how we go about the surgery. Mm -hmm. That next step, is it right for that patient, is their decision. Mm -hmm. um, so I wait for them to make a decision and maybe half will want to do it. Half may not schedule with me. I don't know if they schedule with someone else. So I right. don't know if they were turned off by the surgery or just chose not to use really? me Really? So surgery. if you see 100 consultations, only half will proceed? I don't know the exact percentage. Right. But I probably about half. I would say for, for every 10 consults you'll see, four probably will schedule surgery. Right, but we don't really understand. Because a lot of people are fact-finding. They may not do it now. They may schedule in two or three <clears> years. They, 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 they're trying to understand if this is right. And I think you hit some re real points. There's, there's an upside to surgery. They may be happier with their cosmesis of their breast. Uh, they feel more comfortable. They may like the way their clothes fit, but they may not like the downside. Yeah. So it's an informed decision-making okay. process. So, so if I don't know you and I don't know how good you are and what your practice, of course you could do all that homework, but you know, help me understand you know, how, how do you identify a great breast surgeon? Because, I mean, I think you go to a breast surgeon, they're going to roughly tell you something. Uh, what, what would you tell people? Like, what, what are the sort of red flags or non-red flags or good flags or whatever you want to say? How, how do you go about, you know, analyzing some of that for someone who's never thought about it before now? They're starting to think about so it. So if I was a patient starting from the beginning, the first thing I'd want to know is the people I'm going to see, are they board-certified plastic surgeons? I think that means a lot. I think okay. it means they went through the rigors of the proper training to do this. The right are there way. a lot of non-board certified plastic surgeons out there? Yes, there are a lot of people who practice plastic surgery who are not even never went to a plastic surgery residence. No, come on. How how would that work? Explain that to me. So, you can, could could I become a plastic surgeon? So I mean, could I do breast augmentations? I you, mean, I'm a physician. You believe it or not, a a a almost any specialty can do any specialty as long as they have a medical license. Right. So the question is, as a pulmonologist, can I prescribe Proventil? Or right, right. A, but yes. that's, that's prescription, but, but, but do but a yes. surgical So You're we saying, have general surgeons in the country who do who breast dogs. We have um, uh, OBGYNs doing liposuction. We dentists? Have Did I see dentists? Is that true? I saw. We have dentists now doing Botox and fillers. It's actually legal in the state of Nevada. Um, I have less of an issue with that. But, but you want to find someone who didn't do a weekend okay. course. They've done real right. training and understand <laughs> how to do these surgeries. Okay, and get uh, it. And okay so, so board so certified. Board certification. Okay, what else? Okay, second thing you'd want to look at, and you always have to look at it with, with, with some understanding that it's not everything, is an overall reviews of, the, of that physician. Okay. Right? Um, afterwards, you come in and you talk with that doctor. You should feel comfortable. You should feel that the patients coming in and out of the office while you're there seem happy mm -hmm. that 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 patient feel that physician is you feel comfortable he's competent he or she is mm -hmm. competent in in doing that surgery and you can look at the before and afters and analyze them so w would you say like i don't want to interrupt but would you say like all the things we just went through now maybe not in detail but above the pack, but you know, below. I mean, it's all the different things we went through, not in that detail, maybe. But would you, you would want that plastic surgeon to kind of at least touch on all the points we've touched. Well, if if, if plastic surgeon is so busy that he walks in the room, says hi, and lets someone do the entire console, and you never got to speak to him, uh -huh. you would him or her, yeah. you would probably not see a lot of that physician post surgical, right? So right. you want someone who's going to be. You're investing in this process. You want someone to invest in you, and you want that person to be involved with your care, not just the surgeon. Yeah. Please, you got to remember, the, the patient's going to walk into that office postoperatively multiple times. They right. need to feel comfortable, not with just the surgeon, but with the staff. So, do you the, do you do the whole consultation? Are there practices 
to send a PA or nurse practitioner? I, I, I think there's all types of practices. Right. So so one of the things that happens in, in everything you do, especially in plastic surgery, I'm yeah. in my own little world. So I can tell you how I practice. Right. Um, yeah, but yes, I, I, I think it. there's all different ways right. to practice. Right, but I mean, if you're doing a consultation on a patient, you have 20 years of experience literally in the OR doing it. And again, I'm not trying to belittle uh, you know, other clinicians, but if they're not actually doing the surgery, but they're doing the consultation. I mean, just I would imagine that that wouldn't be ideal. I'd rather have the person who's been in the OR for 20 years doing the initial consultation. Yeah, so there's all different ways it's done. So there are people, there are practices. So you, so to be clear, there are practices where the surgeon is not doing most of the consult. That oh, does really? exist. That okay. does exist. Um, that obviously would allow for a slightly more volume because they can be operating uh, for more time. Um, I, I think, in general, it's yeah. better to sit with the doctor who's yeah. going to eventually operate okay. on you. You know, I think you're just trying to be nice. I'm going to be. Oh, look, you don't have to be nice. I can say it. I think you should see the surgeon. I mean, I'm yeah. going to tell you from my own experience as being a patient. If I have a knee problem, I, I honestly I want to talk to the person who's cutting on me, not but, anyone but else Jonathan, for Jonathan, the initial. Jonathan, you know this is happening all over medicine, right? I, well, so we have it, PAs it, involved and no, no, and, and they're good at what they do. No, but, I, I but get I that, but I'm just you, I'm, when you're doing I, well, plastic surgery, you are better off. Yeah, no, consulting no, no. I, I guess I got, I'm gonna give you a blowback on that. I love PAs and 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 nurse practitioner. I'm not saying that. I'm saying if you're going in for a surgical procedure, other and we're not talking about clinical practice. I'm, a surg- so I'm only talking about surgery. I'm <laughs> that's, saying that's even what in I'm orthopedic saying. surgery, different things. Yeah. There, there are PAs I know. who are, who are well, I'm, seeing I'm, the doctor, I'm, patients. So I'm going to go on the record and say I'm not a fan of that. I I right. think if you're having surgery, yeah, yes, of course it's the, if it's the follow up and take the bandage off or whatever. If someone's going to cut on you, I like uh, I like to see the guy so who, I, or girl. So, so without or, or overspending the, time on this, I agree with you. If you could speak to the surgeon, I say that's a plus. Uh, look at the reviews. I would want to understand board certified. How, what how else? That, how how are you going to be treated after your surgery? How would so, you know that? So, so I get that question all the time. Is, is your post operative visits included? How long are you going to take care? Is of it me? included? Yes. For, so for me, if you're my patient once, you're my patient forever. So right. I have patients who call me five years later and they're having an issue with their breast, and I never charge them to come in and see me again. Wow. They just come in. So all follow-up is free forever and ever? For me, yes. So if once I've operated on them, they're always welcome if they're having something going on. So I have some patients. Yeah. I usually discharge them about a year after surgery. Now, I have some patients who yeah. feel more comfortable seeing me once a year. Yeah. So if I put that implant, they and want to see me once a year for the next 25 years, I'm happy to see them. Right. That's amazing. Yeah. Uh, and honestly, that's why I had you on the show. i got to be very frank. I mean, I think uh, people may be wondering why, you know, uh, this topic and why you, because I know that about you, and it's really nice to kind of get oh, some you. very specific. Right. No, because, you know, uh, uh, you know, one of the cool things about being a physician is you can – Bought, you know, a diamond in the rough. <laughs> and, and, no, seriously. And I, well, and I, and I, and I think people watching this can, as I'm extracting those little, you know, nuggets, uh, you know, where it shows you what a difference, you know, and you know, people say, well, physicians are good, bad. I think most physicians are good and they want to do the right thing. But there are different levels yeah. of, you know, care and expertise. And I think, you know, that's what we're trying to extract here. That you can actually you know, go up, you know, uh, whatever level you're at, you can probably go up a le- level or two potentially. I understand. Yeah, I know Thank you're being you. modest, but okay. Well, okay, so what else can they do to, I mean, how will they know what the follow-up is going to be like? Should they be asking? So, what so will when, when a patient comes in, they're typically in the waiting room for a little while. They could ask other patients yeah, how their experience yeah. was. There's yeah. all different ways to do it. Um, yeah. You know, often, you know, in our practice, Many of our patients are referred in by other patients, so they may have spoken to two or three of my patients prior to even seeing me. So there's all different ways that a patient credentials that doctor. Is that the right doctor for them? There has to be a little bit of a gestalt. There has to be a feeling that this is I'm comfortable here. This I trust this person to do surgery. So and then we'll we'll leave this point. But what are the signs that you know? We'll say I don't want to pick on L.A. or so you, that you're in a mill that that things are just you you're not getting the attention. Are there any red well, flags? Well, if you go that, into an office and you spend three hours in the waiting room, 
And then the doctor spends 30 seconds with you or, mm. or spends no time with right. you. You hear some yelling patients in the background. Right. You hear patients. Around. That would probably be the first sign <laughs> yeah, that it's no, probably time to leave. Right. Other than that, it, it, it has to be like anything when you make a decision. Yeah. It has to be a feeling of comfort. You have to feel that this person, he or she generally wants to take care of you right. and wants you to do well through the whole process. Now, I want to go back to something you brought up earlier, which is, uh, which I think every physician has these days with the internet, which is patients come in with a lot of information that they Googled. Okay, <laughs> let's start with something fun. Give me like the top three th like misconceptions that people walk into the office and say, you know, I've already Googled this and blah, blah, blah. Is, you, is there like one, two, or three well, most I common? Mean, people ask me, will implants pop when I fly in an airplane? Okay. They Google something like that. Okay. Will a saline implant, when I jump up and down, going to make a, wa a washing By the way, machine an, noise? An, so, answer I mean, the, all different So things. how do you answer those? Wait, wait, wait. So, so you answer by saying that's probably something you read on the internet. No, they're not going to pop on an airplane. I mean, okay. it's a pretty obvious answer. Yeah, we okay. wouldn't be putting a lot of implants in if they're going <laughs> to pop on an airplane, right? See, I told you this would be there would be so, some comedic yeah, value so, to So, to, so okay. with that, I mean, so okay. there are always some misconceptions okay. on the internet. Okay, are there any misconceptions that you th that there's a grain of truth to it, but it's probably they don't they don't have it in perspective. So, for years as plastic surgeons, we've spent time telling patients that implants are safe and there's no risk of cancer, there's no risk of disease, autoimmune disease or, or illness, right? And for the most part, that is still true. We consider implants to be very safe. It is true that over the last three to five years, ALCL, which is a, uh, a cancer of the blood, has been found in the scar tissue of around seven to 800 implants. Out of? Millions upon millions. This is worldwide, yeah. seven to 800. Um, they've been mainly associated with a certain implant type, which is textured implants, mainly one brand, which was a textured Allegan brand, and those have been removed from the market. Um, there have been very few cases with smooth implants. So whether that process of that textured implant and the way it adheres to the skin led to this, um, we're not sure. Uh, we just know there is a correlation mm -hmm. um, between ALCL and, and breast implants and in the scar tissue. The second this- Saline and silicone? Saline and silicone. So the second this kind of came to the forefront, more women who felt they may not be feeling well from implants were given a voice, and that became a hotter topic. Even bigger than LCL is implant illness. Right. So there's a very small percentage of women who feel when an implant is put in that symptoms later on in their lives they attribute to the implant. So so then the question, what most people ask is, does the implant potentially make you sick? Um, we don't know. The, if it is, it's in a very, 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 very small percentage of mm -hmm. women. And the answer is, if you believe that that implant is not making you feel well, then the answer is to remove it. Mm -hmm. So I always had my questions for this. Um, mm -hmm. but, but I do think there's probably a small truth to it um, because in my experience, Almost every woman, with the exception of a few, that I've removed the implant from feels way better. So there is a small group who may not, their body may not like having an implant in. Hmm. Do I think it causes autoimmune disease? No. Do I think it causes cancer? No. What, but do what, I think that maybe the whoa, fact whoa, that a farm... Whoa, whoa, whoa. The, the 700 cases, we are, we are agreeing that we think those 700 think, cases were due to that implant so it does i guess I so hear is there a correlation right now with implants and cancer there's a there's a possibility that right. when an implant's put in now keep in mind they have found alcl with other implantable devices so there's a foreign body in there when the bo see. when your body has it there the way it reacts but again when you think of seven to eight hundred cases worldwide it right. is extremely extremely low. well let's go to this um Illness thing because I, I think uh, I think that's a hotter topic. That's a hotter topic. So breast plant illness. So I I think you know in my looking at that, I we, you know what caught my eye and and I I think you may agree, is the breadth of different and vague symptoms that are associated with that. You know it's sort of 
and, and there's a whole host of real diseases like fibromyalgia and other diseases that has this just very nebulous, you know, moving range of symptoms that right. are different in different people. And I think we all struggle with those kind of illnesses. And to correct me if I'm wrong, I think those fall that the breast illness, breast plant illness falls into that category because the, the symptoms seem to be vague, general, um, and not to not to make light of it or minimize it, but uh, you know some of those symptoms on any given day, you know, you could anyone could potentially feel, but not to say that other is not severe in certain people. But in terms of just being tired, run down, you, 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 you hit it right in the head. I, for sure, these are very vague symptoms. Mm -hmm. um, I think as we've got more social media and more people on the internet, mm -hmm. there's groups that talk to each other. They say, well, I, I feel extremely tired. And they say, oh, yeah. I think I feel tired for my implant as well. So they're vague symptoms. Yeah. Um, you know, if your wife gets a cold, you may think you're not feeling well, you feel your throat tickle. Right. So people get worried about them. They wonder whether right. they may be having these symptoms. So yes, we do not know if there's any real correlation with implant illness. I think if someone has lupus or, or something like that, maybe the implant right. may be aggravated. I don't think it caused it. So I don't have that answer whether implant illness actually exists or not. Right. I could just say that for the people who believe that their implants may be making them sick, that it does seem that when we take them out, they, they feel do better. feel better. Yeah. But, but I've had very, I've done thousands of implants I've had very few of my own patients ever come back to me and ask me to remove the implant because they're not feeling well. Right. I think you said to me um, that, you know, your first 18 years of practice, you, you only took out a handful. But in the past year or two, you're seeing more people ask that their implant be taken out. So in my first probably 18 years of practice, I probably took out three to five pairs of implants for 18 years wow. total. That's so one every three or four years, right? Now I probably take at least one out every other week, one right. pair. So it's much more common. Again, when social media and, and people start talking to each other and there's more an acceptance that this right. may exist, yes. um, people start correlating right. certain symptoms. Do, yeah. the, do the implants actually cause these symptoms? If you take someone who's 40 years old, has two children, works a full-time job, comes home, cooks dinner, cleans house, does a whole bunch of things, um, they're tired. They're up in the middle of the night taking care of their children. It, it, so you don't know, are they tired because of their lifestyle or are they tired because they have implants? There? Or you know what? It could be both. I mean, in a sense that <clears throat> maybe a percentage of people are really ill from the breast implant, but how, you know, but there's no blood test to separate them from the ones who are just at a stage in their life where you know they're run down from something else. And if there was a blood test to separate the two, and I'm you know, right. joking, but there, but you know, it may be so we don't that know. that 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 both groups Inter intersect, <clears throat> intersect, and and you are put in the tough position of trying to figure out, you know, which person really has breast implant illness versus some where someone else, you know, may have allergy or something else is going on, maybe even something medical. There's two reasons why we see more implants removals. One right. is the implant illness. <clears throat> the second reason is as time goes on, there's more and more women with implants oh, who true. reach different points of their lives, yeah. right? So they may have put them in at, at 23 years old right. and they were single and now they're married, they have two children. Right. Their priorities are different. Maybe they feel their implants are, are too heavy. They affect the way they exercise, their body shapes and form have changed. They, they just don't want them. Right. And so it's not just the implant illness people are asking them to have now. It's increasing because we have more and more of those people who are reaching different points in their lives as wow. well. So basically, you're saying in your first 18 years, once people got them, for the most part, even as they age and their lifestyle change, they still stayed with them. And now you're seeing, you know, someone who may have got them at 22, at 42, say, you know, um, you know, uh, I don't know if I if I want that. that. Right. So think about it, Jonathan. Yeah. Implants just came out around 1962. Right. Was, was the first silicone implants, and very right. few were done back then, right? Right. So we're getting more and more people as time goes on who has implants. Right. Some people may come in and they may be having an issue, or they want to go bigger or small, and they mm -hmm. change their implant out. Some come in and say, you know what? I've had them for 15 years. I'm done. I loved having them when I had them, but I'm at a different point in my life. 
Wow. And then the other category may come in and say, you know, I don't feel right. And I don't know if it's the implant, but if there's a chance I may feel better with that implant out, I want to see. Wow. That's amazing. So things have evolved, but you're definitely taking more out than you ever did before. So I'll give you an example of a patient who I took implants out maybe two, three years ago. She always had low grade fever. She'd been worked up for a million different things. She had implants in. She, she was always very happy with the implants. She took the implants out. And she still has low grade fevers and, and, and times where she doesn't feel great. And now she wants the implants put back in. So not every illness can be correlated and associated with the implant. Yeah. But for some people, just getting the, you know, they've seen multiple doctors for different issues and they've never have been able to get an answer. So they're at their wits end and their next step is to get that implant out and to see if they feel better. Yeah, wow. So that's really almost like a last resort for someone like, for some, you know, I, I, I don't know what this is, but let's get these out and, and see what. And of course, when they're speaking to people on the internet who's, who mm -hmm. have similar symptoms yeah. or similar things, they and maybe went through the process, had yeah. them removed and feel better, that pushes them yeah. over the edge. Yeah. You brought up something earlier, which is the growth of social media and internet. And I want to kind of just talk to you about that because like in 2000, when you started, you know, I would imagine, it, you know, even plastic surgeons website probably weren't as great. I'll tell you something funny. I wouldn't even have a website. Yeah. So even though a lot of my uh, competitors really had dating websites, yourself here, I, right? I <laughs> felt I had a big issue with putting before and after pictures on the internet. I right. just didn't feel comfortable with that concept. Right. Um, I probably right. didn't produce my first website probably till 2003 or 2004. Right. Um, it, it has become a big part of plastic surgery. And to what degree you want to be involved with social media is personal. I have a website. I don't do a lot of things with the other yeah. social media. Yeah. But we have plastic surgeons now. And, and of course, it's generational, right? Yeah. We have plastic surgeons who are literally taping operations live. Yeah, right. By the way, just in, in full disclosure, you know, I literally had to tie you up and bring you in here to do this. So I li li literally, um, so I, I know, uh, and I appreciate. Oh, but no, I, but I, it's my pleasure. It's always no, happy to talk to you. No, and, and I love it. And I, the reason why, I, you know, it's sort of like the person who least wants to be on social media probably has the most to say. And it's a, it's a little ironic because the people who are often running and doing this and that and so. Uh, well, often when you're doing a lot of social media, doing different things, you're, you're, you're either building your practice or trying to expand your practice, right? So my practice is where I want it to be. I'm happy with the size of my practice. I'm happy with the yes. amount of surgery I do, and I'm happy with the things I do. So I'm not necessarily looking to grow it. So I don't necessarily do as much social right, media. Right. But let's get back to social media and its impact on your industry and the people that come in. How has that changed? And it's literally social media is accelerating by the week. So right. how's Instagram in the last three years impacted what patients tell you and your the field of plastic surgery? Just well, I think overall plastic surgery, you could have a young plastic surgeon come into town who's dynamic at marketing, great at at Instagram and some, and they can build a practice if they're if they're fantastic very quickly. But it but but so don't forget social media is you, you practice during the day and then you do social media on a constant basis. It's not a one and done. So right. you have to look to do that. But but it's allowed surgeons, the younger generation, to <coughs> compete with some of the older generation very effectively, very quickly, right? For me, in my own practice, since I don't really get mixed up in that too much, social media means patients come in with preconceived thought processes. They come in much more well-informed. Some very good. In a good way. I would say more often in a good way. Um, but, but also they have thought processes, which are one way or the other, and they're stuck in that thought. thought Such process. as, give me like some common things that the people, well, with you it, can't get them so, off of. So them. with implant illness, there is this concept out there that the silicone implant or saline implant needs to be removed in block. What does in block mean? Right. It means that in one piece that you need to remove the entire capsule, which your body has formed, your own tissue that your body has formed and the implant without entering that cavity, the, the, the scar tissue cavity, all out in one piece. 
Well, that's fine. I, I, I don't have a big issue with it, but, but, the, but the issue becomes on what that patient will look like afterwards, right? So you need a much bigger incision, often the entire fold of the breast or close to the entire fold of the breast. And if you remove all scar tissue and the patient feels adamant that has to happen, there's a higher risk of a potential complication. And the way the breast will look will usually not be as cosmetically nice. So do we create a bunch of breast cripples, sometimes at a very young age, who believe they're breast are causing their implants are causing them to be sick whereas there's a probably a, a easier way to take the implants out with less risk and a nicer cosmesis of the breast so they're stuck on that okay wh what else do you see that people come in because of social media that they're kind of stuck on and you have to work with them well to well, kind of get know, them off so the concept now that we should go you know half a cup bigger than we really want because you always want to be larger than mm -hmm. than than um you initially choose. That's not true anymore. Uh, early on in my practice, maybe there was some validity to that. That why is it not true? Because plenty of patients I've done surgery on wish they went a little smaller, wish they went a little bigger. It's uh, not just one yeah. way nowadays. Yeah. And this concept that you're listening to some random person telling you that you should go a hundred cc's more because you should be a half a cup larger because you're going to regret your decision later on is not a good way to think about it. You should really try to make an informed decision at the time. Got it. Well, you kind of touched on one more thing. So let, let's just talk about the economics of plastic surgery, the industry as a whole, meaning the manufacturers and, and you know, pl even plastic surgeons. What drives, when it comes to breast augmentation, to you know have more done or use more expensive you know we talked about like silicone is more expensive uh, is that impacting either subconsciously or consciously how the industry moves or is it just people naturally make a decision so i think that the companies would much rather you use silicone implants because i think they're way more profitable when it comes to a silicone for the, for the company chart for the company i don't think the cost to manufacture a silicone is significantly different than manufacturing a saline but we pay a lot more for a silicone implant so i think it's more profitable and i think that would be one of the reasons the company spent a tremendous time getting them back on the market mm -hmm. um I think as a plastic surgeon, what your job, and I go back to the same answer, is really to make sure that patient understands the advantage and disadvantages of both, understands the financial consequences, the decision-making process from the standpoint of finances, and then make the best decision for themselves, which one they prefer. So for the patient, it's important to understand that when they're given choices that economics maybe their own economics but the industry's economics is not a factor in I sh that. it should not play a major role I you know I really discount completely what the companies want me to do and I really just look at what the patients want, want me to do all right so there's another thing I want to really talk to you about because now as long as you brought up removing uh, a lot of breast implants and we're doing more of it Talk to me about what people can expect once they've had their, uh, you know, breast aug removed. Uh, and I, obviously, you probably can guess where I'm going with it. You know, how natural will the breast, original breast, look after? Yeah. And and how, you know, is it after five years? It might be the chances are this after ten years. I mean, can you put any texture on that? It, this is a very difficult answer. So so when I do most surgeries. I look at what they have. I can really give them a, an idea of what they'll look like afterwards, right? When I'm removing an implant, right. I don't know. I don't know. So part of it will depend whether I take out the scar tissue or not, whether I, whether I do an in-block removal, whether I just take out the implant. Um, so that will all play a role on how the ultimate breast will look. But, but how that person's body heals will play a role. How big of an implant was in there? How much breast tissue they still have? How long was if it? If they in? have a 700 cc implant in, and they were an A cup, and they have a thinned out breast tissue, how's that going to look afterwards? Right. So we don't always know. We have guesses. Um, so there's options. So when you're going to have make a decision, so you make this decision now that you've had implants for this many years, X years, and you've decided it's time to remove them. Well, your surgeon should go with the op, discuss with you the options. One choice is to remove the implant, maybe even replace it with a smaller implant, 
right? Maybe size was the issue. Another option would be to remove the implant, maybe do a lift right at the time of surgery and try to reshape the breast so it's more cosmetically pleasing. Third option, maybe remove the implant, see what you ultimately have, see how your breast bounces back. Mm -hmm. And then at that time, maybe six months, a year later, after you see exactly what you have, do your lift, which may be a better lift because you actually see how the skin is contracted. You know, maybe just go over what a lift is. and right. Because maybe I, I know you mentioned it, but if people don't understand what so, you're talking about. So breast lifts are relatively common in plastic surgery. Um, breast drop for all different reasons. People, their breasts can be form dropped or uh, or or they drop as people gain in, and, and lose weight or after pregnancy. So a bre- the goal of a breast lift is to reposition the breast tissue back to where it used to be. Uh, and that typically involves scars that can be as small as a small uh, incision over the areola, could be around the areola, around the areola, down the vertical portion wow. of the breast, or around the areola, down the vertical portion, and across the fold of the breast, which I think is the most common, and that's called a wise pattern mastopexy. And what percent of people that have their implants removed follow up and get a lift? So in my practice, it's very common i'll advise them but you got to remember jonathan it depends what their breast looks like when they're coming into me right Right. so if they're coming in and the breast is already hanging way way low and they have a then i know that that patient if they tell me they don't want a supernatural droopy breast they may want to have a lift right at that but again out of a hundred how many but i often advise patients the majority the majority to get the implant out and get to 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 wait and see what that breast will ultimately look like often we get surprised uh, and they do way better than they think. I see. And I would say probably if I if I had to put a number on it, I would say 70 to 80% never come back to do a lift later. Wow. So it's only a small fraction. Yeah. So, so, But it could be argued or debated at either way. There would be some plastic surgeons who would say, well, why put them through this? If you think they're not going to be happy, why not just resolve the issue right then and there and lift the breast? But I do think there's consequences. When you do lifts, it involves a lot of scars. Um, so so I, I don't think it's a bad idea to sometimes just remove yeah. them and see what they'll look like. Unless you know for sure right. and you feel very confident yeah. that, that but so, they're but, not going to be happy. But, I mean, I, I, there's a, but, so, but there is a financial advantage to doing a lift when you remove a breast. It's, it's another not reason. major. Not no? major. Okay. So, so if you do them at the same time, some people believe it would be a lot cheaper. I see. Um, but we pay a certain amount per hour in the okay. operating so, room. And so it that's not driving tremendously. That. And personally for me, yeah. if I've done the implant removal and that patient comes back a year later and wants to lift, I would give them that same discount what they would have saved if they would yeah, have done so, it. So it's not, not with you, but just, so that's not the driver. So if someone's saying... Um, when you we'll, do a lift on a patient, you've yeah. got to understand you are usually cutting... A, a, around the areola, down the middle, and across the fold. There's real scars on the breast. So there is a trade-off. So if if you're making that trade-off not quite knowing what your breast would look like Mm, without that implant, you you sometimes may be better off to see what it would look like. So uh, so we're going to wrap it up, but I just want to know, is there anything, you know, I've tried to kind of do the A to Z with you, is there any area of breast implantation that's, you know, that really shows up on a day to day with for you that we haven't touched on? Uh, anything else that you can think of that you want? No, I, I think you that you think anyone looking at having a breast implant would would want to have that insight. Right. No, I think you've done a very good job at at understanding, trying to uh, get for me the understanding of, of, of breast implants. I think mm-hmm. that. The only thing we didn't touch on was that all surgeries, whether it be breast augmentation or hernia surgery, mm-hmm. that that or or a knee replacement, that all surgeries have some risk of complications, and breast implants have them as well. And and when you go and you make a decision to do a cosmetic procedure, you can't think of it as a going to a med med spa and getting a massage or mm-hmm. a or a facial that this is a surgical decision and it requires time to heal properly and to make sure as a patient that you follow your surgeon's advice so Mm -hmm. that you have the lowest risk of having a complication such as a bleed in a breast a fluid collection in a breast a dehist incision where the incision may open up any of those complications 
can can be reduced by following your surgeon's recommendations. Oh, that's a great, great piece of advice. Uh, last thing, so if people are interested in at least learning about your practice, you know, what what's the best way for them to look you up or get a hold of your practice? Thank you. So I have a website, it's, it's drstevenmiller.com, um, as well as my office number, which is 702-369-1001, and I'm always happy uh, to see anyone. So. Okay, well thank you, Steve, it was a real pleasure. I really enjoyed it. Uh, I enjoyed it too, John. Yeah, thank, thank you again for coming. Okay, thank, thank you. you so much. Thank you for watching. Make sure you like and subscribe if you like this video. Also leave a comment below if you have any questions or any uh, ideas for further topics in the future. As always, thank you and be well.